All right, here it is, October 9th, and it is another episode of Let There Be Talk. Let me get a little dial, dial up some adjustments here, my friends. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Anyway, I'm kind of out of it. I'm fried. I am just uh, back from Power Trip, which was the metal festival out in the desert out there in the Coachella area. We've been talking about it for months. A lot of people have. There's a lot of controversy over the festival for months. Oh, the ticket prices were too high, all kinds of shit. But at the end of the day, this thing was absolutely next level. My experience on it was, uh, it was unreal. Before I jump into that, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and I hope to see you out at some of my shows coming up. I will be in Colorado Springs, what, October 20th and 21st, some headlining shows at the Funny Pages, and then uh, Irvine Improv, December 20th, these are the headlining dates, and then a bunch of uh, great dates with my man Bill Burr coming up from, what is that? I think it's like November 6th all the way up to the Madison Square Garden. And then closing out the year with Bill at Formula One MGM Arena in Vegas, November 17th, I believe it is. So dates are on deandelray.com. Thank you for joining me here. And uh, I don't know, did you go to Power Trip? Did anybody go to Power Trip? I I do see a lot of people that like to jump in and complain about stuff that had no intention on going at all. And it seems like there's this world geared around everybody loves negative energy and that's how you get your algorithm going and all that. I've been told that many times. Uh, I, I don't, I don't really like negative energy. It's just, uh, it, it just feels like a fucking cancer planner box you know so it's just comes into your feed hey fuck your glasses you know and then it's and then people start battling hey you know fuck you and, and all this and i don't know i don't know what it is do you leave the fucking negative energy in there and let people attack it seems like the world is fucking the world is just collapsing with the negative energy and uh that being said, I couldn't even tell you, and I had no idea how much I needed to go out to the desert and see some of the bands that just absolutely changed my life when I was a young man and pretty much molded me who I am. Uh, for better or worse, people out there, you know, you, you fucking metal head or, yeah, oh, you fucking... You Hesher, you know, you're growing up just hearing idiotic people. And I don't know. I am happy that one of the first concerts I ever saw was ACDC, Cheap Trick, uh, Journey, Blue Oyster Cult, Ted Nugent. That pretty much uh, opened my eyes to just like, wow. Uh, you know, I, I'm not like a smart dude. Uh, I don't have like skills. Like I can't be a mechanic. I can do shit. But I, as soon as I saw that, I thought, there it is. That's what I want to do. And uh, and it was never about, ooh, let's try to do that and get famous. It was just like, that looks like something that definitely resonates with me. Getting on stage and playing some rock and roll and also comedy, of course, comedy being, uh, you know, full force with me now. And I, and I love doing comedy more than I ever did music, which, which is even weirder to think about. So it is, uh, it is amazing to go out to the desert and see some bands that, uh, just, just a bit in my life, since I was, I don't know, 12 years old, ACDC, Judas Priest, I first start rocking them around the uh, Hellbent for Leather, around that record, I guess. And uh, and and then who else? Uh, then Metallica, who's on there, I think, 42nd year. 
just just unreal and then tool really kick-started me uh when they first come out as uh seeing something uh totally outside the box and then gnr i didn't go i didn't go see gnr but gnr was just a game changer in my life back in 1987 88 first seeing them going like what the hell this this is just straight up outlaw and then the mighty maiden Seeing Maiden all the way back on the uh, Number of the Beast tour. I did not see them with Paul Diano, but I my band did open for Paul Diano when he left Maiden. It was so weird. He leaves Maiden and then has a band called Paul Diano's Battle Zone, and I end up opening for him in San Francisco at the Stone. But to, to see these bands and to think about how long I've been seeing these bands was really mind boggling. And it was almost like this, uh, as cheesy as this sounds, kind of a spiritual moment out in one of my favorite areas on earth, out in the desert, out there in Coachella. I love Palm Springs. I love Joshua Tree. I, I love it out there. And uh, to be standing out there, still alive, next to some of my oldest and best friends and newer friends all bonding over music and our, our love of music it was uh it was really uh it, it just wow it was it was it felt amazing to be out there and just to see these bands and 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 take it all in and 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 start to take in my own life, you know, of like, holy shit, these guys have been around. I mean, ACDC, first of all, who uh played the power trip and hadn't played in seven years. And we all know how much this band means to me. And uh and, and just completely changed my life it, to to just have them on. I think that this festival, it was tough to tell, but it might have been about 80% ACDC people from around the world because Metallica are massive, but they were just here about a month ago and they did two nights at the SoFi Stadium where the Rams and the Chargers play. Two fucking nights. And then um, Guns N' Roses has been playing like crazy for the like last seven years. And then who else? Uh, Maiden was here uh, a while ago. So those bands uh, have been playing. But ACDC, there was just this thing of like, are they ever going to play again? Last they played, Axel finished out the, what, the last six, seven shows. And it was pretty much seemed like it might have been done. Brian was out. Cliff Williams was retiring and uh, Phil Rudd was going to jail. It looked like for hiring a contract murder or whatever. And he, he might've been whipped up on some uh, methamphetamine allegedly. I don't know. It was just like this band. It sounded like you were looking at a, a, a guy who was in a band in his twenties, but here he is uh, way late in his, uh, his life. And it, and just crazy shit. Anyway, my point is, it looked like they were done. Then we we kind of know what happened. If you uh, listen to this show, I had them on the podcast. They got together at Malcolm's funeral, talked to each other. Let's go in and do a record, Angus said. They had some old tracks in the can and fired them all up and put up a power up record. And then they couldn't tour because of covid and that was uh, basically the last seven years here of ACDC. Now, next year is ACDC's 50-year anniversary. So everybody was like, well, are they going to tour? Are they going to do something on their 50th? And uh, to the nature of the great ACDC, totally mysterious, not saying fucking anything. Nobody knows nothing. Then they drop the power trip lineup, and there it is, ACDC, originally... Uh, Sabbath or uh, Ozzy was supposed to be on. Sabbath was asked to do it. Tony Iommi said, I don't think Ozzy's able to do it. He passes on it. Then Ozzy takes it solo and of course cancels and Priest gets in there. So for ACDC to announce they're going to play somewhere, 
This is a global uh, following, ACDC. It is amazing. You could be in an ACDC show, uh, not just your average show. If they were touring all the time, but I'm talking about one ACDC show, the entire ACDC army is just going to come out from Brazil, Canada, Japan, New York, Ecuador, all over. Like when I did the uh, opening for Metallica on their 40th anniversary, there are people from all around the world. When it's something special, the true fans fire up the fucking airplanes and head out. So, of course, I, I did talk about it about three, four weeks ago. Am I going to go see ACDC? I don't know. I don't really want to be uh, let down, you know, because uh, the last time I saw him was at the MGM Arena on the last tour, and they were so fucking great. I was like, ah, I don't, I don't know. But deep inside, I knew I was going to go. This is this is one of the greatest bands of all time to me. But you, you're looking at guys that are 76, 77 years old. Angus is 68. And, uh, you know, this music, this isn't like the Rolling Stones, okay? And also, the Rolling Stones, uh, no matter what you think, like, oh, Keith, man, he parties, he gets crazy. No, man, he, 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 he doesn't party. These guys have been keeping it together so they can do these stadium tours. And it's kind of some power chords, you know, just a -na -na -na, some riffs. And uh, they got a bunch of guys on stage. They got Bernard Fowler. They've got people singing backgrounds. They got people playing piano. They got people doing sax and, and horns. There's a whole army up there of younger people that are getting the sound uh, together for the live show. With ACDC, it is five guys playing on at least 110 dB. And and they are playing like full on just, I mean, like hard rock, the hardest. It's not metal like Metallica, but stuff like Let There Be Rock that can run about 13, 14 minutes. That is pretty taxing on somebody like a Clip Williams, who's just over there standing there, just hitting the bass, do, 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 for 13 minutes. I'm 57 right now. And just standing out there at the concert for uh, two days, uh, I, this podcast is late right now because I was tore up. And I'm only 57. I can't imagine. You know, I talked about it before. I do the Bon Scott tribute. Uh, and it's one of the hardest things to do mentally and physically because you're around full blast rock. And you also got to perform and, you know, give a show. So for those guys to fire up the machine and come out, you know, it, it is a, it is a big deal. So I had to go and I wanted to go. Once I realized I wasn't going to, I didn't have any comedy booked because I don't like to, I said, I don't like to cancel any shows to go see a show that I'm at the point of my life. That doesn't make sense for me to cancel a show to go see someone else's show. It's just not going to happen. Not uh, these days. So I head out, me and my buddy Rockline Greg, we head out to the desert. One of my oldest friends, Mr. Bill Fold, is uh, one of the uh, deep, deep, uh, deep guys behind the scene and one of the creators and, uh, and just a a solid old school friend. So he sent me out the uh, the package, got some wristbands. I'm in the pit. Now that was the big thing. People were talking about the tickets. The tickets are way too much money. These things are twenty five hundred. The you know there was the six hundred and eighty dollar general mission. And uh, looking at the uh, the layout. I, you know, if I was going, no matter what, I wouldn't go anywhere except the pit. Now, there were some complaints 
from some people that were telling me, well, I spent all this money. I'm in these seats. They're way too fucking far away. Well, uh, you know, if I'm going to see hard rock or metal, I, I'm going to just get into the pit area because that's just what you do. If I'm going to see the Eagles, I'm going to get some seats. I'm going to sit down and just chill and watch the screens. That's what these festivals are. I was talking to my buddy at the show and he goes, well, look, let's all admit festivals and giant uh, stadiums are absolutely probably the worst place to see a concert just for the concert. And I realized that I'm going for a lot of it is for the hang to see old friends because you get to an age where you don't really see any friends anymore because everybody's fucking dealing with life. So if you can pick a weekend and everybody happens to be going, that is that over any music is the gold for me these days, just to be able to hang out with some friends and enjoy some time away from the fucking noise in my brain. So the the pit, was, it went like this. It went pit, which I can't tell you how many people were in there, but it, it wasn't uncomfortable. I didn't think it was uncomfortable at all. It was a good, you had a good amount of little space there. Yeah, fuck, dude. When I was going to shows back in the day, you were like this, shoulder to shoulder with somebody else. You were just like, I was short. Sometimes I'd be lifted off my feet like, what the fuck, you know? And I mean, they would just cram these people in. So it was not that. Not at one time did I feel like, hey, man, this is fucking gross, you know? And oh, also, which was really weird to think about just a couple of years ago, we weren't even doing concerts. And if you look at an aerial photo of the power trip, it is insane how many people were out there. And just two years ago, we were not doing concerts at all. So it was, it was beautiful to see that. I also kept thinking about was how cool it would be to do comedy out there, like a Dave Chappelle or Bill Burr and uh, friends and go out and just rock the desert with dick jokes. <laughs> so uh, it goes to the pit. And then right behind it, there's a fence, and then which I can't believe to this day uh, that people are just flying to this day. I mean, I can't believe today as I'm thinking about it, that people were just jumping the fence. Back in my day, I would be like, oh, hey, as soon as the lights go out, I'm over the fence. The fence was only about four feet high. I would have been fucked. I mean, the crowd, the audience for a metal show, they were fucking polite. They were polite. You had your fucking cigarette smokers out there. It's amazing how fucking gross cigarettes are, even outdoors. As soon as someone lights one, you're like, oh, God, gross. So I can't believe people did not jump this fucking fence just all out. So it went pit, then a small fence, and then a load of seats, ton of seats, and then a fence, and then some more seats, and then a fence, and then general admission. And then on each side, like a football stadium, were uh, grandstands. And so it was like two sets of grandstands and then seats all the way back. And, and I will tell you this, yeah, the fucking seats were far. And, uh, you know, if I did spend a lot of money, I'd probably be like, how can I upgrade to the pit? But like I said, I'm always going to go for the pit if I'm buying uh, tickets to a show, unless it's going to be the sphere. <laughs> That's how I have to say it every time. Because if it's going to be the sphere, then I'm going to get in a seat and just fucking take the ride, you know, take a look out there. So, you know, that was the first thing. I got a lot of people were complaining. Uh, not a lot of people, just some people were texting me going like, fuck, man. The fucking parking's far away. I don't know what festival you've been to where the parking wasn't far away and you didn't have to do some kind of walking. And I do know a lot of people are just way the fuck out of shape. And if they have to walk even four or five blocks, they're like, this is bullshit, which is crazy. Which, by the way, 
I wanted to give a fuck you to this guy who brought his dog out there. I don't care if it's your service dog or whatever. I can tell you weren't blind and uh, there was nothing going on with you that I could tell that you needed that dog. But this poor fucking beautiful dog was getting pummeled by 120 dB of nonstop fucking metal and uh, fireworks. Two things bands hate, loud, or dogs hate, loud music and fireworks. I felt so awful for that dog. I was like, God damn, that is, that is, just, that is just cruel. It is cruel. Get some headphones for that dog or something or, or you know, fuck. Anyway, I just had to throw that out there because it was just fucking, it was just bumming me out for a minute. I was all soft and old out there. I was like, oh, what are you doing, dude? Why do you got your dog out here? Look, I want Gertie there, but I know it's fucking loud metal and tons of people and dust and dirt. The dog's just down in there. Perfect weather, by the way, 102 during the day which is god awful, but the shows weren't during the day. They started at 6.45. As soon as that sun came down, it was a clean 80 out. Beautiful. I've been to Coachella many times and it is a weather fucking roulette. You spin in the wheel. It could be a sandstorm. It could be pouring rain, semi-desert monsoon. It could be lightning. It could be 114. I've been out there. It was 114 once. Or it could just be perfect with no wind, no sand, no dirt. This was perfect. I mean, perfect. The screens, the sound, the stage were unreal. Just the state of the art screens these days are just, fuck, the whole thing, man. It looked like two football fields wide of just screens that were just perfect. And the sound was great. Uh, I had a, a, a backstage kind of VIP lounge thing. I don't know if they sold that. It was called the Double Black Diamond. But if they did, my point is, buy everything. If you're going to go to a, a festival, look into it. Just be like, okay, is there any upgrade for parking? Yes, it's going to cost crazy money, but just pick one show. Like if I am an ACDC freak, which I am, and they announce their plan, I'm skipping all the concerts for the year. And I'm buying this one super package. I know, you know, working for the Stones for years, these people would buy these VIP travel packs and they were deluxe. You had a bus that drove you right up to the venue. You had food. You got to go backstage in this uh, kind of uh, reserved area. You got a hotel. You got everything but your flight. So I would be like, okay, can you get the black double black diamond VIP lounge? I'm going there. I'll get in the pit. I'll buy the best parking there is. And, uh, you know, and, and just go. If you go on a shoestring, you got to just go and think this could be rotten, but I'm going to make the best of it. I'm going to throw a tent up and fry in my tent. There were people out there camping. I can't imagine being in a tent. It was 101 degrees. You're just in your tent. Oh, my God. But I've done it. I did it back at the Us Festival, 1983. I drove out there from San Francisco to the fucking all the way out there at no man's land in the desert to the us festival. And I will tell you this at a young age, I didn't give a fuck. The us festival had zero shade. Okay. It had stands here and there that had water and beer for sale, maybe some food here and there. It was just a straight up dirt fucking desert a stage at 105 degrees. Now, at fucking 57, would I do that? No. But as a young man with other friends, it was a memory that I will never fucking forget. And I talk about it like a goddamn robot, you know, all the time. 
And what about the Yes Festival? And that's because it was epic. So there was young people out there. I saw a lot of young people into metal. And I know they're never going to forget this power trip because it fucking moved me. And if you're a young person and you went out camping, you got stories 10 years, 20 years from now, you're like, it was 101. I was frying in my tent, hung over from acid. Judas Priest opened up with fucking the Sentinel. You know, you're going to get the set list wrong. Then they went into Love Bites. Like, no, they didn't. They played fucking Living After Midnight. <laughs> you know, that's the fucking memory and the beauty of festivals. And look, like I said, I am fucking old and I need the fucking deluxe treatment. And if I don't have it, I just don't go. And it's not like a diva thing. It's just like, oh, no, I'm, I'm just too old. I did that shit, man. I mean, today I'm fucking fried, like I said, from standing. But it, I'm so glad I went. Anyway, so I got there. Me and Greg got there. We uh, we parked. And uh, it took us a minute to figure out where the fuck the parking was. We finally found it. We went in. And uh, I had you know, a couple buddies had said that they were you know, not having a good time. And as soon as I got there, I saw so many people that were having a good time. And I was like, hey, how is it? People are like, this is fucking great. Dude, this is great. And I was like, oh, okay. I've been fucking hit by the uh, the bummer people. And and, and I, I know, and I started thinking about it last night. I was talking to a guy and he's, I said, oh, such and such said that it fucking sucked. And he goes, yeah, well, you know, he's just that age where he's just cranky now. And uh, if they don't have uh, everything perfect for him, he's fucking furious. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, uh, I know if you go to a festival and you're not in the right frame of mind, you're like, what am I fucking doing? Get away from me, you fucking asshole. Anyway, I got there and I, I skipped the Guns N' Roses Maiden Day. Uh, I said it before, I, I don't really need to see Maiden on the uh, every other tour because they're going to play too much new stuff. And I love Maiden beyond. I cannot sit and watch Maiden play uh, songs when I know that they have so many deep tracks from these classic records all the way from the beginning, all the way up to uh, live after death. There's so many tracks in those records that would make my head spin if they played them. And I get it. They're like, Hey, we're not a fucking greatest hits machine. I get it. Cool. I don't need to go. That's what, that's what I'm saying. I don't need to see it. I saw Maiden a few years ago. Burr and I went and they were doing the fucking super hits and it was unreal. I saw Maiden about seven, eight years ago. They redid the Live After Death tour. It was unreal. I saw Maiden on the Number of the Beast tour. I saw him on all the tours after that. And uh, I'm good on that. So I skipped the GNR Maiden day. So Saturday was supposed to be, like I said, Ozzy and ACDC, but we got Priest. Now, I'd seen Priest uh, a while ago on the Firepower Tour. I had Richie Faulkner on the show. Love the guy. Just a solid fucking human. Uh, but I saw Priest a few times, and I had Rob Halford on. And it was, a, a, it was a, a dream guest to have Rob Halford on. One of the greatest metal singers of all time. First time I saw Priest was on the Point Entry Tour, and I will never, ever forget it. And I think it's one of the greatest live shows I ever saw. K.K. Downing on the center, uh, Green Man Alishi. I mean, all of those fucking deep cuts, you know, Exciter. Stand back from Exciter. Just fucking crazy. But I was like, well, you know, I'll just check into the hotel and then I'll catch Priest to half the set. And then I'll, I'll get ready for ACDC. We got there and Priest had already played four songs. I was pissed. I was walking in there playing the Sentinel. And I was all of a sudden, I was kind of getting fired up. Like, fuck, I should have got here right on time. But uh, man, Priest, they fucking crushed. Scott Travis, that guy, I don't hear enough people talking about him on drums. He has just got the best fucking groove on double bass and shit. He's kind of a, a, from that Dave Lombardo 
camp of just swing with the double bass, just uh, when they're playing uh, painkiller. It's just fucking, it just grooves. You're just sitting there like this. It's not that fucking math metal, you know, it's like that. It's just fucking groove. Halford killing it. But I gotta say, the the giant uh giant star right now of priest is Richie. The amount of fucking slaying he's doing on the guitar is so mind-boggling. He looks great. He almost fucking died a couple of years ago or a year ago or whatever from his heart valve. I, I don't know. Something happened to his heart. He almost died. And uh, and he's a friend of mine. And so is his uh, wife. And man, just destroying. Just destroying up there. It, it, it's amazing when you don't know of somebody and they get put into this um big shoes to fill type of gig of KK Downing. And they just, they just, they're like, like me when I, I get up there with like, like with Burr, you're like, well, I, I've already fucking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm already winning by just being here. I'm going to just go for it. And he's just going for it every night. And Andy uh, was playing on the Glenn Tipton side and he grew his hair out. He's looking a little more, uh, a little more part of the band now. He's playing some uh, explorers. He's got the strap with the uh, reverse headstock, and I didn't mind him at all. Now, you know. And then of course Rob is just fucking Rob. You know, just uh, they. Oh, check this fucking set list. I mean, it's nuts when you look at these band set lists how hard they were going for it but uh you know priest played rapid fire which is one of rapid fire could be like uh early blueprint of thrash metal man it's just it's just there anyway they did uh you know it's funny they did turbo lover and when that came out i remember that era people were like this is this is sucks they got the fucking synth guitars now, i didn't mind turbo lover at all but man, Turbo Lover without the synth guitars now and just fucking metal guitars, it'd be interesting to hear him go back and do some of those songs in the studio uh, without the synth guitars because fuck, Turbo Lover was just, it was crushing, man. It was fierce metal. Which, by the way, Priest announced a new record at the show. What is it? Invincible Shield? And uh, it's coming out soon. And I, I'm kind of looking forward to hearing that. I got I got rejuiced up on the... I mean, I've always loved fucking Priest. Come on. Screaming for Vengeance. Top 10 metal record of all time. But I've always loved him. But, you know, it, it's weird. It's like, I feel like it's like this podcast where people are like, oh, yeah, I'll listen to it when I listen to it. You know, it's it's been around. But, man... Uh, Sentinel they played, which is killer. They played Desert Plains, which just is just a goddamn classic, especially out in the desert. Heading out on the highway, riding on the wind, man. I look at this right here, electric guy into riding on the wind, and I just think right there, Us Festival, God, I got goosebumps. Us Festival flashback, 1983, and here I am, a million years later, back in the desert, watching them fucking... Just go for it again. Awesome. They kill. Then, of course, they, they split from the stage. And there's the anticipation. Uh, the wait is finally going to be over. ACDC. Is Brian going to sound good? What's the drummer like? Who is the fucking drummer? He played on Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill. He was in Slash's Snake Pit. You know, who is this guy? I... I I've never heard of him, and I, I've been around for a little while. Uh, you know, what songs are they going to play? All of that. Just sitting out there in, in the midst of thousands and thousands of those lit up devil horns, all, all in the audience, just fucking badass blinking. That finally happens. Fucking lights go down. Me and Greg sitting there, and uh, 
fucking roll out and they open up with shot down in flames. And it's just like, what the fuck? This is immediately like, hey man, we made some business here. Shot down in flames. Or, or no, if you want blood, the fuck am I talking about? They open with, if you want blood, shot down in flames in the set. But that's, that's the crazy, you know, let you know right away. Oh shit, deep track. Deep track off highway to hell opening. You know, AC DC, they always pick that one song uh, that's like maybe a semi hit. But if you want blood, bam, the crowd goes crazy. Then back in black, Demon Fire off of Power Up. Then uh, Shot Down in Flames, like I said. Then Thunderstruck, which uh, is a, one of the most biggest hits for ACDC ever. And probably one of the most uh, money generating songs for uh, commercials. That shit is all over commercials, man. Immediately. So there we are. We're the first five songs in. And I'm just taking it in. Whoa. Angus is Angus got gray hair. It's long. You know, Angus had different hairdos all these times. He's had short hair. He's had long, long fucking hair. But there he is, man. Haven't seen him uh, since I did the podcast with him. He's got the long gray hair. He looks fucking great. He's got the blue shorts on. No more moon flashing from Angus. I think he's like, hey, I'm 68. I don't need to show you my ass anymore. Uh, he didn't take uh, his shirt all the way off anymore, which was interesting to see. Angus always would take his shirt all the way off. He just unbuttoned it, took the tie off, and... Uh, pretty much played in a, a just the white shirt and the shorts and um, multiple SGs. It took a while for the infamous back in black SG to come out, which is my favorite of all time. It's the black one with the full white pick guard. That's some uh, guitar nerd shit there for you people. Uh, an SG custom that has the ebony fretboard and the diamond inlay. Should have had three pickups. I think they took the middle one out, put the full pick guard on. And uh, and then you start looking around. Okay, Brian, can he sing? Is he, uh, you know, what happened to his hearing and everything? He's pulling it off. You know, uh, he's up there. He's 76 as of Thursday. Uh, you can see he's like really like, you know? And uh Right away, you're like, well, can he do a whole tour for a 50 year? Now, I will tell you this. I have heard rumblings uh, while I was out there that there is a tour booked. And it's going to be like a, a once a week type of stadiums, maybe 10 stadiums. And for the 50 year anniversary, that's what I heard allegedly. And there's no way they're not going to tour us. I watched this last night. They're going to probably just do this one more run. I don't really see them able to do another run two years down the road. So this is a fact. If you've never seen ACDC, don't ever say I'll catch them next time. Because after watching this entire performance, which was 24 fucking songs, these guys delivered 12 Bon Scott songs, 12 Brian uh, Johnson songs, 24 songs. I thought, okay, Angus and uh, and Brian, they're going to be able to do this for probably maybe 20 shows next year. 10 in the U.S., maybe 10 around, the, maybe end in uh, Australia or something. But um, I don't know how long you know how much longer brian could do it he he was great but the you know it is a struggle to sing acdc like i said me at 57 it is a struggle now matt and i still don't know how to say his last name is it luge uh matt the drummer was uh like i said with uh with richie faulkner matt was the fucking man he was the he was the, the winner of the night back there. Just full Phil Rudd feel. Perfect tempos. 
perfect. This is how you know a drummer is great. When you don't notice them. When you're not ever thinking about the drummer, that's when you know, oh, this guy's good. When you start thinking about the drummer, not in a Danny Carey way or, you know, uh, a Neil P a Neil Peart, not in that way where that's what it is, you know, or, or a uh, Dave Lombardo where, yeah, you're getting the drum flashing. I'm talking a normal drummer. When you don't notice them, that's when you know the guy's killer because the tempos are perfect, the feels perfect, and you don't even know. You're just bobbing and grooving, going, this is fucking, this is fucking bad kills. And you don't even know why. It's because the fucking drummer is just invisible groove back there. And that's what he did. He came out, and this is when I knew I loved the guys playing. He played Hell's Bells, and it was the first time I had ever heard it, the proper tempo live. Somebody, I posted it up and somebody said, sounds a little slow to me. And it's like, yeah, that's because the way you've been hearing it is way too fast. And that specific tempo has to be right on Hell's Bells or the groove is gone. I never loved Hell's Bells live because I always thought like they're playing it too fast. Hell's Bells is the top five ACDC song for me. That is a large statement to say. But it is the top five ACDC song for me, Hell's Bells. And when I heard the fucking perfect groove coming on, that's the fucking groove. And I was like, holy shit, he's fucking nailing it, man. Now, you know, some people were making comments on the vocals. People make comments on vocals. All these people, oh, Axel can't sing or or Brian, oh, is he hitting the notes? It looks like he's fighting it or whatever. Look, man, this shit is so fucking hard. It, it's amazing. Uh, you know, like Headfield is 60. That is eight years younger than Angus and he plays guitar, but that's fucking what is that? 67, that's 16 years younger than Brian Johnson. 16 years is a lot, a lot. So, you know, these guys are way up there and they never thought they were going to be singing when they're 76 years old, have a drink on me. There's just no way you think about life like that when you're in there recording songs. You're like, we could be gone tomorrow. I could be dead in a year. I'm going for it fucking today. And here he is at 76, coming back from the hearing damage and not singing for seven years live. Maybe a couple songs, the Foo Fighters uh, thing, a couple songs with a band in... Um, in the UK, I saw, but other than that, he hasn't, you know, just singing, you gotta fucking train, man. It's like boxing. You know, look at Tyson right now. I think Tyson could actually fight uh, in a heavyweight championship. That guy's fucking still training a badass. Anyway, the set list could be the for the Brian Johnson. First of all, they said it was the longest set he had ever done in his career. Uh, could be the greatest Brian Johnson set list I've ever, ever seen. Um, Thunderstruck, like I said. Then they go into Have a Drink on Me. Now, I will tell you this. Matt was fantastic, but I will give you a couple songs that didn't work for me. I thought Have a Drink on Me was too slow for some reason. I don't know if they slowed it down because Matt nailed all the tempos. So... I don't think it was something where he fucked up. I thought maybe they're just playing it slower. It didn't really work for me. And, you know, Angus, there are some licks that uh, could be tough faster. You know, so maybe they slowed it down a little on purpose. I don't know. That did not work for me. Um, but that's just nitpicking. Uh, sounded like they tuned down a notch for uh, Dirty Deeds. That didn't really work for me either. 
And then uh, as much as I love seeing dog eat dog in the set list, it, it's not a song for Brian to sing. It's just, we can, we can get some more Brian songs in there. They didn't really touch anything off a flick of the switch. They didn't. And they only played one song off of for those about to rock. So I was thinking, it, it, look, we know we love the ACDC Bon Scott era, but there's some fucking Brian era that is mind boggling off a few records you're not touching, which is for those about to rock and flick of the switch. And Flick of the Switch, after all these years, is finally getting some full glory. So Doggy Dog did not work for me. And um, let's see, what else? Uh, oh, Cliff Williams, just a fucking 10. Just a 10, how great Cliff Williams was. And uh, uh, okay, so those are some of the things I didn't think worked. Uh, stiff upper lip. A lot of people love it. The drummer Matt recommended it. It's it's not my favorite, but I'm not going to complain. Sin City sounded great. Of course, Brian's been able to do that for years. I think the highlight of the night was Riff Raff, and uh, of course, Let There Be Rock with the 13 minute Angus solo. And uh, that's really where I could just really feel the drummer, Matt, just fucking solid. You know, these bands, they're going to have to have some younger players in the group if they're going to keep going. I'm starting to realize it now. Oh, yeah. Get some younger guys in that can carry a lot of it and have the marquee dudes like like Brian and Angus up front there. But, you know the drumming is so fucking key in ACDC. Everybody just thinks it's so simple, but it's not. Anyway, so ACDC, I uh, I got to say, I'm, I'm so fucking glad you've been in my life all these years. I, uh, you basically probably, uh, you, you probably saved my life from just being a complete fucking lunatic by uh, that day on the green in 1978 and me seeing Angus and going, okay, I, I want to play music and Bon Scott out there in that vest with those tattoos. It was a game changer that day in September of 78. And uh, I, I just, I, I, I just got to say hats off and thank you. And it was a, an honor to be in the desert and see you. And, uh, I think congrats on the 50 years is uh, is uh, in order. And I can't wait to see what tour you drop and what ideas that you're going to uh, have for that. Next day, Tool just had Justin on. Fired up for Tool. I haven't seen Tool since the day Bowie died in San Diego. I went to go see Tool back then. And I remember leaving the gig. I talked about it and uh, Bowie had died that day. So I was ready for tool and I was going to take some mushrooms, but I rethought it because I was like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to fuck up out here. What if like, what if it doesn't go good? And then I, I, I don't enjoy the night after enjoying ACDC and Judas Priest so much. And I didn't want to be a freak around my friends. Like, dude, fuck, I'm tripping. I, Take me over here, will you? You know, um, so Tool, you know, I was ready for Tool. It's funny, Tool is a band that either you dig it or you don't get it. I was talking to this guy, I go, dude, I can't wait to see Tool. And he's like, oh, you, you're a Tool guy? I go, oh, yeah, fuck yeah. He's like, yeah, I never, never really got into it. I was like, yeah, well, it's, uh, it's not for everybody. And standing there watching them for two hours, I was jaw dropped like i just can't even believe these four guys are making this incredible sound and adam has some of the best original guitar tone i've ever heard ever just that bouncy weird dun 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 just so original he he's got the marshall stack 
He's got a di two diesel stacks, diesel uh, amps, and there's his silver burst Les Paul, and he's playing a V. He's playing a V now, a Gibson V with the split Gumby headstock. That's some more nerd shit there. But uh, Maynard fucking up there with the glue on Mohawk, just killing it with his weird mystique and moves. Justin, Justin's bass, bass tone. I feel sorry for whoever lived in the 10 mile radius of power trip because they were definitely getting full Justin just full fucking bass juggernaut. And then of course, Danny killing him. Tool absolutely uh, crushed it. The highlight of the night, stink fist, of course. Uh, just unreal. The set list a lot from the new record, which is cool. I get it. And uh, oh, they played Swamp Song from the Undertale record, which is wild. I, I don't even think I've ever seen them play that. They never really touch much on the Undertale record. Brandon, one of the uh, uh, friends of the Patreon, one of the Patreoners, he said that he, uh, he thought Undertale was uh, an almost. I don't agree with that. I think Undertale is a, a goddamn original masterpiece of uh, metal for the time when it came out. It was like them and Helmet. Helmet was doing shit no one was doing. Same with Tool. And the videos from that with the claymation, just unbelievable. Anyway, uh, Tool, just killing it, man. The Pot, Invincible. Setlist was fucking pretty good and real dense. Real dense, man. The fucking stage was dark. They had crazy video up there. Just like exactly what you expect from Tool. Just this is going to be a great tour the next month or two that they're out. Go see Tool. Oh, my God. Um, And then, of course, it closes out the night with uh, a band that pretty much became my favorite band somewhere around the 30 year anniversary when I was sitting in the Fillmore one night and I was watching them celebrate 30 years. That was uh, 12 years ago. And I sat there and went, you know what? This is pretty much my favorite band. Um, you know, ACDC, of course, up there. Prince up there. Uh, but Metallica just being those Bay Area, you know, heroes and just showing everybody how it was done all these years. And uh, at the last minute, I got a text. Where are you at? My buddy got me the snake pit. Me and Greg headed in the snake pit, ran into the great Chris Robinson and uh, talked to Chris. I talked to Chris for a while, posted a photo. People are like, you got him on the tag. You got him on the podcast, right? He's going to do the podcast. At some point, you kind of, it's weird where you, I, I, I go through these emotions of like, well, Chris Robinson, to me, has been one of the greatest rock singers of all time for me. At the same time, there's been this weird thing with Chris where it's just kind of on and off. You're just kind of like, well, is he cool or is he kind of fucking, I don't know. So he was fucking in a great uh, a great mood. He was there with his wife and uh, very approachable. I said, hey, man, you know, I, I just reintroduced myself. I always feel weird. Like, hey, Dean Del Rey, we, you know, with this, that. And he's, oh, yeah, yeah. I could tell he doesn't fucking know. And uh, I finally said, hey, man, I'd love to have you on the podcast. I've uh, been trying to get you on 12 years. He goes, have you been trying that hard i mean like i haven't heard anything i was like i don't know how to get a hold of you i asked your brother he goes oh okay <laughs> you know but you know hands down chris is one of my favorite singers of all time and amorica three snakes and uh and uh, southern harmony are just they've been played as much as back in black and master of puppets and highway to hell and Prince is sign of the times at my house. It was great to talk to him. And he was just there, just having an incredible time. He was there all weekend, rocking out, having fun. He was, I I, I watched him at times and I, I envied him 
he's an old soul and he did not look at his phone or maybe once he'd look at his phone, but he wasn't on his phone. He smoked a little fucking reefer, rock out, just smile and dig. he's digging it, him and his lady. And I was like, man, I, 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 I wish I could get to that level of, uh, I don't know, you know, just, I don't need my phone thing, but, but then again, I like to have my phone for memories and put shit out and, you know, my brain's not even that, my memory is not even that fucking good. So I'm always like, oh fuck, I, I did that. I forgot. But uh, I always do feel weird when you're asked somebody, you ask somebody, uh, I asked him a couple of years ago to do the podcast. He's like, oh yeah. And just when they give you an, oh yeah, you know, just, yeah, they're not, they're not into it. So it, it gets to this weird point where if you're famous, your podcast huge, people just do it. They don't give a fuck if the show's good or who you are. They need to generate some press for, you know, the uh, project they're working on. And you kind of want to be at this level where the show's cool and people just do it because it's cool. So it, it, it's that weird thing where you're like pandering, like, well, you know, I fucking, yeah. I said, I had your brother on. He goes, oh, yeah, well, I don't know if I want to do it now. He was just joking, but it was funny. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> anyway, I got into the snake pit. There's about a hundred people. The snake pit uh, really reminded me of my mom because I'd taken my mom to see Metallica in the snake pit back in the, the Black Album era. And uh, it was, uh, it, it really grabbed me for a minute. I walked in there. I was like, oh, my mom was in the snake pit. She just, she was floored. She, you know, to you bring your mom to the snake pit. It's fucking, oh, which by the way, uh, shout out to Tom Morello's mom just turned a hundred beautiful jack black came over there and sang some sabbath while morello's son was killing it on guitar what a great fucking uh, congrats uh to morello's mom ruth i think is her name ruth i, I don't know if my brain's working fuck i might have i might have nailed it but i'm in the snake pit and every time i see metallica i get so fucking uh so emotional because i'm just like many 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 memories just flying the whole fucking time man it is wild and kirk hammett one of the greatest guests on left to be talking one of my favorite days ever and and just hetfield i, I want to say this hetfield is an inspiration to me he just looks dynamite right now he looks happy he, his body is in perfect shape. His voice is sounding great. His right hand is just as fast as it was when I saw him, you know, the first couple years of the band. Just, it's just on fucking real. Headfield, look, the whole band is great, but Headfield right now is firing on another fucking level and it's that level of divorce freedom let's go play metal i'm happy to be alive i'm happy to have fucking billions of fans i'm gonna just enjoy my life he looked great kick-ass haircut great clothes unreal playing that uh that old v uh opening with whiplash creeping death for whom the bells toll sandman Luxie Turner, love I, I love all the new stuff too, man. Uh, on on seventy two seasons, man, they busted it out out there. The highlight of the night, believe it or not, um, it really blew me away, and and it blew away a couple people around me. Was the day that never comes? That was a, a track that came out a few records ago. Was that like seven minute, six minute single they put out? It started out slow and then got all metal. Just a fucking kick-ass song. I remember my buddy Sean, he was standing next to me and he goes, it's such a great song. And to say that on a, a, a track way deep in Metallica's career, it's just, uh, just great to be able to say that. Anyway, that was the highlight of the night to me. They almost looked like Blue Oyster Cold up there. They got, all three of them got lined up. Rob, 
James Kirk, and just up there, just doing that weird mid jam on the day that never comes. And it was the song of the night for me, which was fucking wild. It was fantastic. The entire Metallica set, I would have to say, you can't fuck with Metallica. They've been on the road now for a year and they are a well-oiled machine. They sounded so fucking good. Look, GNR, they've been out like seven years and I didn't see their set, but uh, you know, uh, they've been out a long time and that could be a long, you know, that could be a little burnt. I don't know. Maiden, they're on and off, but but Metallica has just been playing these double night stadium gigs with different set lists and they're fucking, they, they have got it perf perfected. The sound, the moves. I'm watching them, man. They are so, it's crazy to watch them and see like signals, just kind of like Hetfield looking around. Okay. And he's like, okay, Kirk Hammett's over there. There's a spot over here where there's no one. I'm moving over here to get this part of the audience going. And it's not like cues, like they're not going like, hey, you over there. I can just see these guys. They understand. No one's over here. I'm going to go take this fucking pocket over here. And, and it is just incredible. And I got to give hats off to Rob. Rob has really uh, kind of come into it finally. He's not wearing the fucking shorts anymore and the basketball jerseys and stuff. Uh, he's got the hair. It's not in the braids. It's it's not the, you know, he's got the long hair. He's wearing some kind of cool suit pants, a black t-shirt, and just laying it down, killing it on uh, Orion. They played Orion. That was my second favorite of the night. Whenever that tune comes, it's like, fucking bring it on. But he was killing it. Boo, do, 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 do. Somebody had a... a, a a uh, Cliff Burton, the action figure, the little action figure. It was beautiful. I'm going to post a photo of it. They had it sitting on the stage in the snake pit for the entire show. And I was like, I was rocking, right? And then I looked down and I go, oh, God, Cliff Burton. That is so cool. Cliff Burton's here, you know? And uh, it, it, it was a magic, magic. It, to be in the snake pit, after all these years and just to be able to watch Metallica in the snake pit with just like, you know, just room and just really getting into it. it. Look, can you tell I had a good time? Yeah, I had a fucking good time. Did I have great credentials? Yes, I did. But like I said, you know, uh, if you're going to go to a festival, do some investigating Talk to some people that have been and go, hey, where's the best to stay? Where's a great hotel? Where's the good food? What should I, where should I sit? How is the park? Get it all out. Or just go and fucking freestyle it and just whatever happens, happens. Like, God, that sucked. Or, you know, or God, that was great. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. I don't know, man. I'm pretty fucking fried. I got to tell you, I'm fried. I'm glad I didn't do any mushrooms because I was already burnt. And I got to get ready for a uh, a week of shows. And I'm just kind of like, whoo, man, I'm old. I'm ready to, I'm sit down at a concert years old. <laughs> that's, that's how old I am. I'm ready for Nick Cave sitting in a theater, just chick kicking back, watching this guy kill it. Thank you, Metallica, Judas Priest, uh, Tool, and um, and uh, who am I missing? I'm fucking out of it right now. Uh, ACDC, you fucking dummy, so dumb. Thank you for the great fucking weekend and the uh, years of uh, great music. And thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed my little uh, power trip rundown. And uh, I will tell you this, when ACDC drops those uh, tickets, get some and go see them because uh, you don't want to be that guy, like I said. Oh, GNR, they dropped uh, two days at uh, Hollywood Bowl, November 1 and 2. 
That's uh, pretty prestigious. In the tour at the Hollywood Bowl. Pretty fucking cool. Right down the street from where they fucking started. Whiskey a go go, the Roxy, the Troubadour. Right down the street. Scream. All the clubs. There they are, closing it out at the Hollywood Bowl. Pretty fucking cool. All right, I love you guys. Uh, join the Patreon, DeanDaleRay.com uh, is the tour dates and the merch. Patreon.com slash DeanDaleRay for bonus episodes. And uh, thank you so much for your support. Hope to see you out there. Keep the candles lit, my friends, and uh, see you soon.